Give us, O Lord, that vision. Raise up that which is holy before thy throne. For by your pleas, with the standards that we establish and the truths that we teach. Help us, Father, to understand the necessity of the Church of Christ and to train the generation who might understand it as well. We pray, Father, again, that you help us to understand the essentials of that great commission which Solomon understood and prophesied, which Christ, your Son, established in the earth. And now we pray for the wisdom from on high. May it see, O Lord, and believe, and do the things committed to us. Give us, O Lord, we being so feeble. Give us, O Lord, thy strength. We ask this in Christ's name. Christ's ministry random? Was it a random ministry? And let me just deal with the geography for a moment. Did he just randomly go where perhaps he might be, might have the truth more accessible or more, shall we say, uh, to his encouragement received? Was there a starting place? Were there goals? Did he meet those goals? What was Israel's response to those goals along the way? Were there patterns to his behavior? In short, is the Great Commission as epitomized in Christ's headship something that can follow, or did he just go about and teach wherever he could get a place to teach? He having nowhere to lay down his head. And when his disciples were sent out, their ministry ran. Let's take a few cues from the scriptures themselves. When he healed the lepers in our text, Luke 17, there was nothing random about it, as we're going to see. They were sent to the high priest. That wasn't random and lawful. We'll come back to that. We are told that the word of God went to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Christ supported that position. In fact, if you go to Matthew 15 a moment, you can see that. Sidon, that is outside of Israel. The old woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. He answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after me, after us. So she got nowhere with him. She went to his disciples. They came back to him. Could you do something with this woman? And he says, um, he answered in verse 24 and said, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he didn't answer to that point. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Problem. Then, Lord, what are you doing in Tyre and Sidon? This bespeaks deep design. He's in a place where the inheritance is not supposed to go. But he refuses initially, even after great imploring. She comes to him, he doesn't even answer. He doesn't even answer her. She goes to her disciples, I'm sure each one of them, pleading, 
maybe taking hold of their robes. They ate so much so they came to him and he says, I'm sent to the lost house of the lost sheep house of Israel. It's still no, no, and no. And he's in a place where the inheritance is not to be found. Side and entire. That makes matters worse. However, side and entire was a place where Solomon received an inheritance. She says, <clears throat> and by the way, that's the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not fit to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And she said, That's true, Lord. She had an answer for him. That the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. He said, No, no, and no. And is still in the process of saying no when she trumps his answer. She's wrestling with Jesus Christ. Actually, he's initiated the conflict of faith. Just like in the Old Testament when Jacob was on his way, he meets the Lord and they wrestle. Moses is on his way to Egypt and the Lord attacks him because he didn't apply the sacramental sign. It may not be important to Moses, but it's certainly important to Christ. The Lord initiates a wrestling. He initiates strength for the servants to increase their faith. And so it was here. That's the conflict we spoke of last week. Faith is built for conflict. It matures in conflict or it weeds out. It becomes, the conflict becomes the filter. The offenses in our hearts toward God, when he chooses the wrestles we're going to see, becomes the filter whereby his mediation is either accomplished or the flip side of the election takes place. We call that reprobation. Therefore, we ought to fear. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, Christ said. This woman was persistent. It isn't that she said, oh, he's the Christ and he's treating me like other doctors and other people I've asked for help. No one can help me. Ah, oh, he's how often and how quickly do people give up on Jesus Christ? You've heard it in our economy. He, they, they don't get their way, therefore, oh, he's not around. That's not this woman's struggle. She wrestles with Christ. She will have nothing but a yes out of him. He's culturing her faith. Oh, the mean Jesus, he's not answering me. I've spoken to him and he turns his back. He ignores me as he speaks to others. I go to the disciples and I plead with them. And they don't answer. They even come to him. I'm sure she was watching. He says, no. I'm sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then she comes and she asks. And he says, it's not fit for me to give the food, the children's food, to dogs. And she had an answer. Faith had a response. Yeah, but I get the crumbs. If I'm a dog, I get the crumbs. So you have judged your sins. You do see what you are. Well done. Faith, your faith has made you whole. The theology came out of the struggle. She saw her heart for what she really was. Remember, you and I may think better of ourselves when our goodness is not extended to oppress God. The psalmist says that our goodness extended not unto thee. We are just like that. God's. I know that's a bit of a shock. I know that's an insult. But that is the way an unbeliever acts. And we are unprofitable. And Jesus is about to tell us that in Luke 17. You see, the same process, the same struggle occurs in Luke 17. Turn there, please. Remember, the Lord knows our hearts. We think more highly of ourselves, as Jesus said, than we ought to think. All of us is invaluable. Just ask us. Not the Lord. Faith is cultured in the conflict of wrestling with Jesus Christ. The easier
easier method is inside the home and covenant homes wrestling with your parents. But the wrestling still occurs. The parents now provide the wrestling from the Lord if they are parenting at all. So the covenant model inside the home provides parents that apply the training, discipline, means, resource, and love, and the children wrestle with their parents thinking they're making the mistake. They think they're wrestling with them instead of Jesus Christ. And he's watching. Either faith is then conflicted in culture or faith is driven out. That's the pattern. Here in Luke 17, the passage starts in the very first verse that sets the standard. There will be Offenses. It's impossible, he says, but that offenses will come. Of course they must come, because God's going to temper, train, and mature his elect with offenses. He's going to do other things with them, too. If he's going to culture and wrestle with his saints while he's in heaven, he will send offenses. Woe unto those that touch, however. He may stand back, as it were. In fact, this whole chapter exudes a standoffishness in Christ, just like with the Syrophoenician woman. We get the idea that when people came to Christ, he was there and he embraced them and he's lovely. How about the standoffish Christ? This chapter exudes that, as it were. Note my last statement. He's actually not standing off. He's very intimate. He's wrestling. Just like he did with Jacob. And when Jacob, when he was going to go, Jacob said, I want to know your name. He said, why do you know, want to know my name? Seeing that it's secret. And he touched all of his thigh and he crippled him. Very often, wrestling with the Lord can be dangerous. You end up with an accident you can't undo. He lived the rest of his life. But then he was called Prince of God. And that meant now he's going to walk with stature among men. And the Holy Spirit's going to surround him with a shield and stand by him. He touched Bathsheba and crippled her in the loss of a son. But she became of Israel, the noblest woman in Israel. And God's grace elevated her until all nations bowed before her. She entered the palace room, and even her king's son bowed before her. She had to wrestle with Jesus Christ first, though. David was crippled by the Lord. He lost four sons. He abused his office. When he bowed before the Lord in the 51st Psalm, you can see, I'd offer a sacrifice if you'd accept it, but that's not good enough. You wouldn't receive that. It is my walk with you that I abhorred. Therefore, he was crippled that he might become as it were Israel. Just like the Syrophoenician woman. And here in Luke 17, Christ gives us that paradigm. And much of it, if not all of it, is drawn from Solomon. The pattern's there. Solomon had to learn what his daddy was conflicted with and how they got to his throne. We'll see. In Luke 17, it's impossible that offenses, it's impossible that offenses would not come with law unto him. Those that bring the offense are headed for great judgment. Christ said it otherwise. Those that touch his little ones are better for them that are millstone, they hung about their neck. I've seen that in my life. You've seen it. Those who have touched you have touched others, have touched me, have touched the church. Woe unto them. For God has judged. He doesn't take it lightly. He doesn't change. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass seven times a day, forgive him seven times. Yeah, if he repents. What was it Micah said? 
Lord be pleased with ten thousands of rams and bulls, all that blood shedding, all those rivers, those gutters full of blood coming out of the temple. The Lord required me to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. Do justly. We're talking about Christ who is doing justly. And we are to emulate. We're going to learn more about that in these next verses. The offenses bespeak a need for justice. It isn't that we can't bear the injustices, it's that we must, as Christians, learn to prevent them. That's a side note. Mercy, however, is very much part of this passage. If he really does repent seven times, if you have been one who has wrestled with Jesus Christ, meaning you understand how egregious your own sins are, then how many times did you ask for forgiveness? How many times did you wrestle with the Christ and turn his back on you? How many times did you plead with his disciples? How many times did you turn back to him and he said no until your faith matured and you saw what you really were like the Syrophoenician woman? I'm guessing there were hundreds of, of appeals to Christ and that great struggle of your life. Love mercy towards someone else. If your heart has been cultured by that kind of strife, where you knew the darkness, the blackness, the turning of the back of the Lord from away from you, things have gone bad and I was faithful, where are you, Lord? So we're about to see that here. He's standoffish. If, in fact, you have known that of your Lord, then you will learn to be merciful in seven times is nothing by comparison. Let's get to the heart of this, though. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. That's exactly what he's doing. The issue is all about faith. The conflict of faith. So where does Christ go? He doesn't answer it. He decreases the demand. See this seed? You know, had somebody asked me to increase faith, I'd be looking at maybe a monument somewhere. See that? Or maybe a mountain like Everest. I'd pull out a picture and say, that's what faith... Those are the kinds of things we do. What Christ did in answer to their statement was to increase our faith that he went to a grain of mustard seed. Something so very tiny. He says, if you had faith like this, let me translate. If I'm walking with you, that kind of faith can uproot a sycamore. It's not faith for faith's sake. We're not fetus. It's a fancy term that means faith for faith's sake. See, all over the television, I'll just believe and things will go your way. Just believe. It. That's fetism. There's no more strength than the human heart can provide. We're not fetus. Faith means your Lord's walking with you. And he's certainly capable of uprooting a sycamore tree and throwing it in the ocean. Have you ever seen a mature sycamore tree? If you go out to uh, Massachusetts, near Philadelphia, about Massachusetts, excuse me. Uh, no, if you go out to Pennsylvania, excuse me, Brandywine Battlefield, you see a sycamore tree that was there during the battle. Sycamores last upwards of 400, 500, 600 years. That tree has been described. In fact, there's several in the area that were there. Part of the battle. Massive trees. They endure. They're well-rooted. So it doesn't matter, he's saying, how well-rooted the evil might be, how large it is, as David with Goliath. It doesn't matter how powerful its branches, how, uh, how uh, dignified it is, how deeply rooted. If I'm walking with you, it'll be torn up. And you cast into the sea. It's not that you have to whip up some aura of faith. But you do have to win the wrestling with Jesus Christ. Win that wrestling match. Walking with him. When he calls you to obey, and you don't, you're wrestling. If he calls you to obey and you do, you're going on to the next wrestling match. You're mature. Either way, 
What happens next in this, in this Luke 17 is your inheritance and mine. Look what he says. In verse 7, but which, which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say to him, uh, by and by, when he has come down from the field, go and sit down uh, to meet. And will not rather say to him, make ready wherewith I may sup and gird myself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink? Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded in my trial now? So likewise ye, when ye shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants, we've done that which was our duty to do. He's just described the Syrophoenician paradigm. He's using the Roman model. Of course, there were Jews, of course, living there. They had the same model. He's saying, now what you do, look at a Roman household. Or an aristocratic household. Now where do you find that the servants having come in from a long, hard day are first to sup and the master's family steps back and says, yeah, go eat. He said, no, I don't think so. That's not the way it happens. They come in from a hard day's work and they wait upon the master. They receive nothing. And being unprofitable servants, they say, it was our duty to perform this way. We're unprofitable. Now you say, no, wait a minute. That really is harsh. Let's take it, let's reverse it for a moment. We're the servant, we come unto a master, we say, now we performed, you must now honor us, thank us, whatever it might be. We're holding him at ransom. God will not be held at ransom. He has, however, given us his word. And it's replete with his goodness. We do things his way. That's what he did with the Syrophoenician woman. He did it his way. I am not come but first for the lost sheep for the, for the of the house of Israel. She begged him, turned his back. She begged his disciples. They, they couldn't help her. They implored with him and interceded with him. It'd be like you in her place asking the Lord in prayer and the heavens are brass. You go then to other Christians and go pray for me. And they pray, nothing happens. And then they all come to the Lord, including you, and you cry to the Lord, and nothing happens. There's reasons for that. We don't hold the Lord at ransom. He is the master, he is the Lord. He has proven his good graces. We've constructed a theology in America that does the opposite. We dictate the terms. He's so loving that he gives to us. That's where that theology goes. He, we compliment him in the expectation that we will receive love from him, and love means the benefits. That's the theology we constructed. And God is tearing that down in America. It holds him at ransom because, after all, you're in love, and because you're in love, now if you don't perform, I get to accuse you too. That's the way that works. We construct his behavior according to the laws and precepts we invent. When he doesn't do it, we can accuse him. We are not the ones to be accused. We've reversed the whole scenario. He's the one that isn't good. He's telling us this is the way I'm going to do things. Now we come to the third episode. The lepers. We spoke of them last week. We'll do it again. There are ten of them. The key is, as you heard me describe last week, verse 12, as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, it's my understanding from Micah that we are to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. It would appear that none of that occurred here. In Christ's initial response. They're standing afar off. They're used to being stoned when they come get they come and get close to the community. They're driven away. So while they're afar off, he says, go to the high priest. Now, in every other episode I see, besides others, people draw near to him. 
They can talk with him. The demon, even the demoniacs have their children, for example, they're demonized and possessed. They're cast, the demons are cast out. The gathering demoniac, a terrorist in his, in his area, comes to, comes to the Christ and falls, falls down and worships him. In every other instance, just about, people have access to Christ deliberately, I mean, directly, except here. They're standing far off, and now they start to wrestle. Go to the high priest. That would be Leviticus 14. Now the wrestling occurs. Oh, this group will come to you. You're doing to us what the rest of the community does. They push us away. They won't come near. Are you afraid that you're going to catch the leprosy too? We're unclean. You're treating us like all Israel does. That's the temptation. The wrestling has now begun. Go to thy priest. And they who are far off in turn go to thy priest. Nine of them, they're all healed. On their way they are cleansed. Not immediately. On their way, they were cleansed. One came back thankful. I believe he's the only one with a clean conscience. A, they were cleansed along the way. Did they go all the way to the high priest? We're not told. Only one had a clean conscience, came back and thanked him. Christ marvels at that. Weren't there ten of you? I believe nine were bitter toward him. He kept his word, they did not keep, perhaps did not keep it. The whole point was to obey the law of the Lord. They did start that way, and as they went, they were cleansed. So did they get to the high priest? Your guess is good as mine. They received a blessing, but none of them weren't thankful enough to come back. I think they were ashamed. Or they were angry, or whatever happened in the heart between then and now and then. They might have cursed him in heart. We don't know. One had a clean conscience, came back and thanked him. I believe he went to the high priest. Whether the other nine did, we don't know. He comes back and he thanks the Lord. They wrestled with the Lord. That's the lesson of the kingdom of God. They wrestled with him. Their heart's temptation was designed designed by him to elicit that ugly. What are you going to do with the ugly that comes when he doesn't perform? It's the ugly that comes out of us that he's dealing with. He knows it's there. He's the one that brings that to the top. Leaves the gold underneath. The swag is brought to the top. He just brings it up. That's the process. So they apparently, nine of them, were at least thankless. We know that much. That's the major, that's the first lesson of the kingdom. You wrestle with the Lord. You have to learn, you and I must learn to do justly, love mercy, walk humbly. It would appear that Christ was not doing justly with them. It equally appeared that he was not being merciful, and it equally appeared that he was being rather haughty, not humble. I'm sure they took one of those temptations to heart. That's the ugly inside of us, the accusative heart of the Christian. We accuse. Let's go over to Micah for a moment. Micah 6. In Micah chapter 6, <clears throat> he raises the question, Verse 2, he has a controversy. The Lord has a controversy with his people. He's pleading with Israel. And in verse 3, O oh my people, what have I done to you? And where have I wearied you? Testify against me. We weary him. In our wrestling, we weary him. 
And for I brought you out of the land of Egypt, I redeemed you out of the house of, of servitude, and sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And verse 5, he says to my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab. And so there was a power in Balak, the demonic. And I didn't know all of it. The occult reaches to others powerfully, but it does not reach to God's people when they're walking with him. Remember Balak? And I did not allow Balaam, even his prophetic gift, I did not allow him to curse you. Verse 6, how shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Well, first of all, if you're going to do that, you understand Christ's justice, his mercy, and humility. Do I come with burnt offerings with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or ten thousand rivers of oil? His sacrifice was not an ostentatious display. Verse 8, he showed you, what, oh man, what is good. What accompanies the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and Israel and Solomon is an ethic that does three things. It is just. We seek that which is just and upright. We learn to be a merciful folk. Because we've wrestled with the Lord and he touched the sinews of our thighs, he's already hurt us. We know what it's like when God wrestles with a servant who has yet to learn. We learn a humility that's willing and ready to bow the knee, to learn to be merciful in humility, and however, to hold up justice for justice sake, for the sake of what is just and upright. It may be we have to hurt a friend to be just. It may be that we might have to hurt a, a child, a son, a daughter, usually in her adulthood is what I'm talking about. That may be needed. It may be that a neighbor who we've loved and been friends with we lose, or a family member, a relative. It might be. It may be that God struck inside our household. We have to say yea and amen. That's the price of holiness, of walking with the Lord. We're going to see in a minute. We're going to test each of our hearts for offense. Here, this morning. Where the ugly can come to the forefront and accuse God's word of being contradictory. When Solomon came to his throne, Israel had suffered a series of bloodbaths, plagues, tyrannies. David had himself suffered from his own sins, as had Bathsheba. Solomon came to the throne as the son of that pair. He learned the lesson of mom and dad. He accorded his mother the status of wise counselor. She's epitomized as wisdom in front of her, chapter 4 and beyond. Nowhere in the ancient world do you find a woman personified as wisdom. You find deities, perverse deities of all sorts. But an actual woman personified as walking as personification of wisdom above and tiring above others, Solomon imputed that to his mother. And it carries through the remainder of the book. She trained him under the headship of David, who had to maintain justice in the land. As she instructed the son of their inheritance, he's the only son who had an oath of inheritance given to the parents, recorded in Scripture. No one else got that oath but Bathsheba and David. There is no other pair. That's the son of my vows. Chapter 31. She got the oath, and she fought for that, for the ascension of her son to the throne, because the Lord had given her that. Against Adonijah, against Joab. You note that in verse 9, the Lord's voice cries into the city, and a man of wisdom 
shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod who hath appointed it. Are there yet treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? And the scant measure that is an abomination? Shall I cut them pure, verse 11, with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? In other words, wickedness will have its end. There's that woe. They're committing the woes, but woe unto those that commit them. The rich men, they're up and full of violence in verse 12. Therefore, in verse 13, I will strike you as sick, and I'll make you desolate for your sins. They will receive their arara, their curse. They don't like God's words. They don't like his government. Look at verse 16. The statutes of Omri are kept, all the works of the house of Ahab, and you walk in their counsels. You don't want my laws, but you want Omri, Jezebel, and Ahab's laws. You like those. You keep those. Same with America. We don't want God's laws in the church. We have pulpits of thundering, Romans 13, to obey every, every abomination that comes off the pen of the legislatures. We're so accustomed to bureaucracies. We don't know another kind of wisdom. But it's a curse. Turn back to 1 Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 10. chapter 10, we've spoken of Solomon earlier, we've spoken on the last several weeks. Solomon established a pattern for raising up a kingdom. We might call that the Great Commission. Solomon, as we saw this morning in our family Bible, Solomon taught kings. Now, let's take a look here for a moment. Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, verse 1. She was heard in the name of the Lord. She came to prove him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem, a very great train, with camels of first spices, much gold, precious stones. And she came, Solomon, she knew them, all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her everything. And when she was done learning, verse 4, when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom in the house that he had built, she said in verse 6 to the king, It was a true report that I heard of mine own hand, land of thy acts and of thy wisdom, albeit I believe not the words. She came as a skeptic and as a critic. She just didn't believe it. She saw some things that were wondrous. Pela. Now, you know, if you look at it, to be frank, it's no big deal, at least on the surface. What was it that astounded this, this woman who's used to monuments and palaces and architecture and spices and gold? She came with a great train. She could certainly afford it. She had all the gold in the world. The spices, the camels, the long train, the entourage. She had all the kingly, queenly decor. So apparently there wasn't much that as a queen she was not accustomed to receiving or seeing. But what she saw here shook her. And so it was, she sees what? In verse 5, oh, the meal of his table. So what? I've seen many nice tables. I've seen plenty of places where um, <clears throat> it's all good eat, for example. And a time where I marvel. And the sitting of his servants. So what? I've seen people sit. You're doing it right now. What's the big deal? Well, was she in a nunnery? She'd never seen anything before? And the attendants of his ministers of state. And their clothing, their apparel. I could see getting excited about that. You know, there's not clothes stores out there. But is it worth 
all the gold, all the spices coming there with all that entourage and saying, I was skeptical. And now after I have heard you, I now see what was it such a big deal. And note, cupbearers, and the ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. It's like someone punched her in the gut. She couldn't hardly breathe. She was so awed. I've seen people, seen people climb steps. I've seen people sit down and walk in that now. Now, by the way, verse 8, happy are your men, happy are these thy servants. They rejoice. What was it she saw? So, we've all seen people sitting, we've all seen people standing, we've all, we've all seen people hearing instruction, we've all seen I'm sure we, at least in television, we've seen cupbearers, and we've seen architecture, sitting down at meals. Now let's add the wall of war to it. Avad, servant. You have classrooms full of servants, including the word, by the way, by its usage includes the Levites. He had class, I believe he started the movement of Western civilization having classrooms. He had an academy. That's where the Greeks and the Romans got it. Maybe they, they turned the world upside down. He had classes of servants that sat in front of him. Even when all these kings sat at meals. Now, eating's no big deal. We enjoy it, but hardly stand out unless there's something to explain it. In the New Testament, Peter marveled when he was told with all the food there and that horn of plenty, eat. He said, no, Lord, I'm not allowed to. What I've cleaned is clean, and I've told you to eat, now eat. Now I understand what he says. You're going to clean the nations. There's a theology behind the dietary laws. It's not about nutrition. It's about the people learning faith. And so as they sat at table in front of Solomon, I believe he used those dietary laws to explain what predators are and what you kings ought not to be, what scavengers are, those that eat dead. They eat the refuse of society, meaning bad ethic, rotten ethic. I believe he went around that table and used their food as illustrations of their ethic, which is why the dietary laws were given to begin with. And she marveled. You remember, she marveled after he explained to her. He's explaining the conflict of the nations of those dietary laws, and his servants were being taught proverbs. We're told elsewhere. He had 3,000 Proverbs. He had Psalms. He taught them the struggle of faith. And then those kings went their ways. His people, his servants, went in Israel. And they effected a reformation. And it was sudden like. He trained disciples. That's a lot. Word for servant. She saw classes after class in the great palace of his. She saw she was seeing that temple. He explained its eschatology. It's a great commission in marble and gold, in lambs and altars. And the law of the Lord sitting is the Ark of the Covenant that will be taken by the Levites, God's ministers to the nations. He explained an eschatology with things right in front of her. She saw his ascent. He picturing the Christ ascended like the Christ did and will. She got a whole theology that explained the laws of the Lord in ways you and I still have to learn. And she learned from him how practical it was to take that into life. We have theology here in America that doesn't seem to have any impact. It doesn't seem to go anywhere. It spins its wheels getting everybody saved. But it doesn't take them down to the corner. It doesn't take them into their jobs, their businesses, their schooling. You can't take theology and apply it Solomon-like to the world around for the conflict of faith that the church must embrace to wrestle with God, to wrestle with his mind that he might show us his word. That is his mediation. When the word of God comes out and you receive it is because, as he told Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father did. Christ as mediator 
gives his word. Yes, he also died for us, didn't he? But he gave his word. He had to explain that cross. Let's take a look. Take a look at, just for a moment, at Matthew 16. In Matthew 16, in verse 21, and from that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto you. And he turned and said unto Peter, Get the guy and be saved. You're an offense. It must needs be that offenses come. But one of them by which offenses do come. Peter didn't get it. The central issue of our theology is the necessity of the Lamb of God being once being struck down, being crucified. He didn't understand that. He was near the end of Christ's ministry, and he still did not understand that the Christ came to be a sacrifice. How do you not understand that? That's theology 101. He didn't get it. He knew all about lambs. Just like he knew all about the dietary laws. But he didn't understand what they meant for faith and faithfulness. That he did not understand. I'm sure Christ got his attention when he, was, when he called him Satan. What you just said is satanic. That I not go to the cross. That I not fulfill the sacrificial system. Which is the heartbeat of the law of the Lord. You have not understood my word. You have been, been influenced by the devil. You're an offense. He's sitting on the wrong side of that as it were of mediation. He doesn't understand. The magnitude of the justice needed to forgive him, of the mercy needed to forgive him, of the justice that must be poured out and wrapped in Christ is what he didn't understand. Not just the symbol, symbolism. Peter did not understand the magnitude of the injustice that he was and of the necessary mercy that was needed to forgive him. That's what he didn't get. It's one thing to understand theology. It's another thing to get underneath the hood and get the thing to run, to work. Why is this engine starting? I understand all about engines. I go and climb underneath the hood, I can't get it to start. It's one thing to know the, the diagram that outlines the car, it's another thing to get the thing started. Another thing to get it running, keep it running. The same is true with Peter. He'd been there for three years almost and still did not understand Theology 101, why he was there. And why there was a justice needed that goes way beyond lambs, bullocks, and pigeons. He didn't understand that his Lord must be rejected. As Luke 17 says, must be rejected first. That he did not get. He knew Moses. You find Moses making Moses and Elijah. You find us making the same kinds of mistakes. I'd like you to turn, however. Turn you, I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. At verse 4. Verse 3, actually, the people thirsted for water, the people murmured against Moses. Verse 3, and wherefore, why is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Now, that's like the leper standing afar off saying, Lord, have mercy. And he says, go to the high priest, except they've gotten no other direction from Moses except the commandments of the Lord, which is, should be plenty. And they say, we are thirsty and hungry. Take care of us. They're chiding with him. 
And verse 4, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They'd be almost ready to stone me. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, take with thee the elders of Israel. He associates the church with Moses, first of all. Moses represented the Christ. Take thee, and thy rod were with us. What is the river? Take it in thy hand and go. That rod would struck the Nile. Take with you, you and the elders. Behold, I will stand before thee there on the rock in Horeb. Thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name the place Massa, Excellency. And Mirabah, God is my help. Because of the child and the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Well, you're with me or not? You brought us up here, and now we're thirsty and hungry. You're with us or not? He struck the rock. He used the same rod that was used to strike the Nile, and he struck the rock on which the Lord said he was present. Turn over to Numbers chapter 20, please. Numbers chapter 20. In verse 6. Actually, again, go back to verse 3. And where, Why have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? There's no place of cedar or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. In verse 6. Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the, of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their face, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Take the rod. That be the same rod. And gather the assembly. Together thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak to the rock before their eyes, and it shall give thee his water, its water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation their beasts drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation to the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, he was sanctified in them. Well, did Moses strike the rock or didn't he? But more to the point, was he commanded to strike the rock both times? The first time, he was commanded to strike the rock. The second time has the same details. And he struck the rock, and the Lord said, you're not going into the land. You've been unfaithful. The word is, in fact, you, you, ye, you and Israel have been unfaithful. This is the incident that got him up on, up on the mountain looking in, but not being able to go into Israel. And the first generation died in the wilderness. Their children went in. Now, one that might find offense with the scriptures might say, well, look, this is a contradiction. Same details, it looks like. Actually, you got to read it more carefully. But the question then becomes, he struck the rock the first time and they got water. He was ordered to the second time he struck the rock. And God says, you're unfaithful. Do you know how precise the law of the Lord is? Well, it was a precision that went right by Moses. You know, sometimes people get kind of antsy about how precise theology has to be. It's like science. You put in the wrong value in a formula, you're going to pay for it. You cannot do with God's laws what men do with their social habits. Sloppy. God is very, very exact. When, the prof, when he told the prophet, you will go nowhere, you'll go to, except to Bethel, you'll pronounce against it, and you will not stop aside, you'll not stop anywhere to get, eat or drink, or you'll go right on back home. And he stopped by because an, because the old prophet, a respected man, said, come on in and 
I was told that you could come here. And the Lord spoke to him mm -hmm. through that old prophet later on. Because you disobeyed me, you're going to die. The law of the Lord is precise. There's no room for guesswork. Let me ask all of you, why was Moses condemned for striking the rock? These are two different instances. This happens a couple of years after the first one. And he's near Kadesh. He's in the wilderness of sin, not the wilderness of sin. Why was Moses condemned for striking the rock the second time? The rock represented Christ. He spoke. The word of God shows Christ's mediation. The word of God gives what? That's what Christ. Uh, that's what Christ's uh, mediation is about. The giving of His word. If Moses had understood the theology behind it, would never have struck the rock. Christ cannot die twice. Once he is to be struck. There's no second sacrifice. It's an abomination. Because you're unfaithful, he you said you're not going to go into the land. You did not believe me. I'm standing on that rock, and that rock is the Lord. He used the term unfaithful. You represented, pictured in Israel, a twice struck Christ. That is an abomination to God. The rock is being spoken to the second time. The first was the striking, the second, the word. He struck it twice. Those images are very important. That might sound like it's pressing figurative language, but you have to reverse the issue. Reverse engineer. Why was Moses condemned? Because those pictures are designed with precision. Israel learned something about their Christ. Certainly wasn't. They died on the cross once. A one-time sacrifice. And from that one-time sacrifice afterwards would come the word that refreshes his people and causes from Solomon's servants to rejoice to your heart to rejoice. That's his mediation. He is the rock. That's all theology. I have a systematic theology right behind me. I can give you chapter and verse. I have a great theology that will tell you exactly that. But you see, Israel had to learn it from the pictures. They were cultured. God was honing that theology in their hearts. They were learning it for the first time. Moses should have already gotten it because he represented Jesus Christ, as did Solomon down the road. Peter should have gotten it after almost three years of ministry. He still didn't get it. He had to be called satanic. You get the point. Moses, we're told, quite literally broke faith. Therefore, and note the consequences, by the way, of a saved man who breaks faith temporarily. There's a chastisement that goes with that that will not be changed. Fear greatly to chide with the Lord. It does not matter at that point you're saved. Fear the Lord. Keep his word. Don't chide with him. Let your heart tremble before it accuses him. Those who chide with the Lord face the Lord, and what they might face is something very permanent in their lives. If the Lord makes a decision that's permanent, all the prayer in your life will not change it. David lost four sons. Solomon, at the end of his reign, broke his kingdom apart. Moses lost an inheritance. He could only see it. He couldn't go into the land. Peter cursed and swore never knew him. And would die upside down to demonstrate his faithfulness. Paul would institute persecution while he was Saul. He had the word of God. He's in the church. 
He paid for it by being a pattern from that point on of suffering. So if you never end it, yes, he's the great apostle. And yes, his inheritance is great in heaven. It's a hard thing to live in life. When Paul himself tells you to work out your salvation with fear and tremble, do work it out and do tremble. Because the results can be permanent in the meantime. The apparel of the servants of Solomon, that's explained also in the law of the Lord. There's a whole theology of being covered, atoned. Adam and Eve were first covered. Servant of the Lord is covered. Christ used clothing. There were classrooms there of, the, of Solomon's servants being given proverbs, being taught at length and in depth. Kings would come. The Queen of Sheba would come. They'd see a theology of the ascent onto his throne. They'd hear the instruction of the great king. They would see an eschatology in the temple of the Lord, the great commission yet to come. They'd see it uh, exemplified in Solomon before, right in front of her eyes. Even at mealtime, they went through the dietary laws, I certainly believe, where she heard all about ethic being symbolized in that, in the clean and unclean foods. Here's how to clean your people. He could do a whole theology on cattle. Domesticated animals, cattle, herds. From moving from Iraq, Lions to cattle, the car. He could have done a whole lecture, a series on commerce. Put your sword away. Stop being a predacious nation. Build up. Allow your people to build up their wealth and invest it. She heard marvels in economy, marvels in theology, marvels in, in politics, and she was breathless. Just from some simple dietary laws. Just from the apparel of a servant. And his servants rejoiced for his wisdom. He represented the mediator and gave his word. And when the Christian receives his word, it caused the heart to rejoice. Augustine said we were made for Christ. I agree with him. It is specifically the word that enraptures the soul. Because we receive it's the Hebrew word enough. We receive an answer because of our quest in life and our lack of assurance. We get answers, and it strengthens us for the conflict of wrestling by faith to build his kingdom and be a part of it, the majesty of it. The Bible is a cup. It's a marvel for quickening. It's a marvel for maturity. And from cover to cover, it is a miracle of unity. If you don't know what the what the what the sacrifice is, then know off and up, read Leviticus. If you know what that means, read John. If you know where it's going, Eschatologically, read Solomon and his sacrifice that he initiated, dedicated the temple. And if you still don't understand, then read back there in the epistles and see what the atonement's going to cover in Revelation and how it's going to sweep the earth. There's a union to the scriptures. There's a glory to it. There's a beauty to it. It's miraculous. And usually sits on our shelves because we're too busy. Be a part of it should be your daily meal. Skip one of the three and take that as your meal. And let your heart really rejoice. Nine out of ten lepers didn't do that. One did. He came back rejoicing. And his response was he worshiped. Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, we are brought before thy throne and we trust in thee, thy mercies. We 
pray, Lord, that thou wouldst keep us in thy love. Help us, Lord. Help us understand the unity of the scriptures, its quickening effect, its maturations, and the fact, Lord, that you have wonderfully shown your goodness despite what might appear your harshness. Be it the Syrophoenician woman, be it Moses, be it the ten lepers. Nonetheless, you've shown us from your word. Your word quickens our soul by which we rejoice and the wicked do fall. We ask you, Father, for your mercy. Please hear us as you walk with your Son with us. O oh Lord and our God, help us, we beseech thee. We cry to thee, your mercy. Teach us, Lord, to do justly as Solomon did with the two harlots and gain the name in Israel. As your son did with the ten lepers and the Syrophoenician woman and even Peter. And in all cases, he showed his great mercy. As he walked humbly among men, teach us, O oh Lord, to emulate. Teach the humility of the one leper that came back and bowed before him and worshipped in thankfulness. As he rejoiced for the effect upon his life of your healing word, as our mediator, so it was that men stood in Solomon's presence and heard the wisdom of God, and their hearts made them happy. They rejoiced. Let it be so with us. Help us, O Lord, to believe, to bow the head and believe on thee, O Lord. Not be faithless, as Moses was at one point. Help us to see, O Lord, that you are the master. You will not be held at ransom. We are unprofitable servants, and our goodness is not extended to thee. O Lord and our God, help us to learn the unity of all of the Holy Scriptures. We ask this for the sake of your Son, that he may be glorified in our midst. Pray, Lord, that you'll teach us to pray for this particular church and raise her up. Help us, Father, to be faithful, not fail as Moses did, to see the glory of the Church of Jesus Christ, despite the fact that she falls on bad days throughout our entire culture. Help us to be faithful, to maintain her for people quit. You have to raise up another generation and condemn this one. We now ask thy blessing, thy mercy in Jesus' name in our worship this morning.